Hello and welcome to Designing Worlds, the show all about design and designers in virtual worlds. I'm Elric Merlin. And I'm Safia Widdishans. And today we're in Second Life, where we're going to be exploring the deep down virtual mine, a fascinating region that was created in association with a very important and award-winning documentary film made by Sally Rubin and Jen Gilliman. And Jen joins us here now. And we're also joined by Gianna Borgnine, who's part of Sandcastle Studios, the organisation that oversaw the virtualisation of the project, the creation of this Second Life environment that reflects the real world in the documentary. Welcome to the show, all of you. Yes, welcome. Hi, thanks so much for having us. Yeah, thank you. I'm excited to be here. So, Jen, if I could start by asking you to tell us something about the film. Although it's called Deep Down, I understand the film looks at something rather different because it's actually focusing on mountaintops. Yes, the film follows a couple of friends in eastern Kentucky who live in the Appalachian Mountains. And a coal company came to town while we were filming and wanted to create a mountaintop removal coal mine. So we followed the two friends, one of whom was deciding whether or not he wanted to lease his land to the coal company for mining or, and the other who was basically leading a community fight to push out the mining company. So the deep down refers to the deep down that's the, the coal that's deep down in the mountains but also the decisions that we have to make deep down about our own values. Right. So with mountaintop mining, let let me get this straight because I I've not come across it. They actually remove the top of mountains to get at the coal. Yeah, this was a practice that developed in the 80s uh, when they were trying to mine coal as cheaply and quickly as possible. Um, mm -hmm. So as you probably all know, the the previous form of mining involved uh, tunneling deep down into the mountains and it's a somewhat dangerous practice, you know, while we were filming we heard about a disaster that took place that took, claimed several miners' lives and those mm -hmm. do still happen with deep mining, um, which is still happening all across Appalachia and in many other parts of the world and the U.S. But in the 80s they developed this practice where they basically drill big cores down into the mountainside. They first clear off all the trees and soil um, kind of dump that down into the valleys, which is called um, basically like overburden, which just means it's it's a burden, it's waste. Um, so they dump that into the valleys and fill up the streams usually, and then drill big cores into the mountainside and put explosives in there, and then blow blow up the mountain um, and clear away the debris until they get to the next layer of coal. Wow. That seems incredible to me. I've I've seen a vast open cast mine in Poland, but that was just sort of scratching down from the surface and and even so the environmental considerations there were horrendous. So I can only imagine what they must be when you blow the top off mountains and start dumping everything into the, the valley. Yes, it's actually a very devastating practice. When we first learned about it, uh, we could not believe that this was occurring in, in the present day and, you know, that we haven't been able to move beyond this, uh, mm -hmm. not only using coal as a form of energy, but doing this really, really destructive practice um, that affects a lot of people, not just the folks who live right near it. Um, it also, you know, the loss of the trees is a huge loss. So losing those forests um, that are basically cleaning the air for us. <clears throat> in some cases, these mines are 40 miles across. Um, they're huge, huge sites. Oh, good so they really are destroying some of the oldest forest land that we have in the U.S., and it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a travesty. <laughs> wow, that's, that's remarkable. Um, and uh, I was going to say, without wishing to get political, but... but perfectly reasonably getting political, how do the mining companies get the permission and access to do this? Yeah, well, there are some environmental protections in place, but the, the problem is that the companies are usually able to get waivers um, to work their way around the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act. Uh, so they basically apply 
usually to their uh, state office of surface mining to obtain a permit. Uh, and sometimes they have to wait a while. Occasionally a process like the one we followed in our film takes place, uh, but usually they, they just kind of rubber stamp the permits and, and they can begin mining as soon as they have access and the leases to, to mine a particular piece of land. So what we can do now, I think, is to see the trailer for the film now. Um, can you give us a little bit of an introduction to it, do you think? Yes. Uh, what you'll be seeing is a two-minute trailer for the film. The full film is about an hour long, and it was on public television on in a series called Independent Lens that's on PBS. All right. So let's see the film. mountaintop removal is a crime of geologic proportions. I had no idea is the first thing people say. I had no idea. No more can I sit on my porch for the dust. I can't enjoy the sound of the birds for the coal trucks flying by my home. The blasting has brought me out of the bed in early mornings, thinking of terrorist attacks. They're going to take at least down to that flat. I'm trying to protect my home. I have to live there the rest of my life. But our life is in danger every day. This is land that's been in my family for four generations. And I love it. That's my happy place. I think it was William Blake that said I could either create my own system or be a slave to another man's system. Right now, I feel like I'm straddling the fence on the subject. I know strip mining ain't perfect, but it's a good thing. That's our heritage here. Texas has oil. Idaho has potatoes, and we have coal. Mining is our economy. I hate strip mining, but I love all my friends that have jobs because of it. Merciful God, look at that. That's Sayers Branch. Oh my Lord, I never dreamed. Part of the deal is they're gonna offer me money up front. Not everybody has a price. I know you believe that. Bill, I'm gonna be in that strip job. Not in my lifetime, this is not gonna happen. you decide to add a virtual element to the film uh, by devising these regions in Second Life? Well, we really wanted to find a way to share not only the complexity of the situation in the mountains, but also a little bit more of a visceral sense of what it's like. Uh, when, we, when I was able to fly over the mine sites to film from the air, I really got a sense for the first time of how enormous they are and and you know, that feeling was something we thought we might be able to share through Second Life. I had been exposed to Second Life primarily through my workplace. I work at a media arts center called the Bay Area Video Coalition in San Francisco, and we have a Producers Institute program where documentary producers come together with technologists and developers to prototype new media projects that help them to sort of extend their, their film and the content and subject matter uh, to reach new audiences uh, through different forms of media. And I met Bernard Drax, who's a Second Life reporter and friend, and he kind of got me first thinking about using Second Life for our project. Oh, well, that's neat. And uh, this was when Gianna became involved, was it? Yes, when we, after we prototyped the virtual mine, we had a sort of skeleton of what we wanted to accomplish. And Bernard introduced us to Gianna and her team with Sandcastle Studios, and we were really impressed by their previous work. And so they came on board to build out what you're about to see. Cool. Excellent. So how did you decide on the way that the virtual mind would be presented, essentially as a, an interactive game, isn't it? 
Yeah, well, Sally and I, uh, the co-directors of the film and co-producers of this of this virtual mine, are both educators, and we really wanted to try to create something that would be usable by educators. So in thinking about games as a way to really communicate complex systems, that's what we wanted to try to recreate here, and we knew that it would be hard to accomplish that on on a full mass scale. So. I believe Gianna helped us think through these mini games. Uh, so we wanted to take people through through a progression through this complex system by by creating a few levels of mini games that um, could be tackled in the course of a of a classroom setting. Right. I believe there are there are three elements, and we're going to be seeing those shortly. Yes, the progression basically goes from mining for power as we as we do now in real life mm -hmm. uh, to trying to reduce demand for electricity which is another way to kind of reduce your impact mm -hmm. and then uh, finally producing more sustainable forms of energy through through solving a few puzzles right mm, excellent just just the sort of thing we need really I think to um get people thinking early about uh, all the implications of uh, how we use resources and climate change and stuff like that. Uh, Gianna, tell me, um, did it take uh, a long time to actually create this? What were the tricky bits? Well, from beginning to end of the process, um, it took about two months. And uh, the trickiest part, I guess, was making sure that everything would work together cohesively across the two sims and no matter where you were in the game or if you wandered off somewhere that everything would work and then trying to make it easy. Um, we were hoping uh, Jen and Sally gave us the opportunity to uh, let people come in from the PBS show. So we were hoping that newcomers would come as well, but we want it to be easy enough for them to use for maybe their first time in Second Life. I see that you've used a lot of media on a prim to access, for example, external websites. And you also control the user's viewer, so they're focused on a particular screen. We'll see some examples of that, I think, as we explore further. Yeah, some of that was just going back to the easiest way for people to be able to view things. And uh, we thought by allowing it to sort of autofocus on stuff, if you weren't mm -hmm. familiar with how to move your cameras or such, that it would be easier for you to keep in control and see what's going on. Right. So um, have the pair of you been um, pleased with the virtual representation? Yes, we've been thrilled with it. And it's been so neat for us to be able to come in here and interact with others. And we've had virtual screenings in here as well. Uh, we've heard from a couple teachers that have been using it, uh, that it was a really great tool that they discovered. Um, and it was, it was actually just also a very fun experiment. You know, I think it will, it will change how I think about my media projects in the future. And, and I may consider doing other game projects. Oh, that's neat. Oh, that's, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, I believe, Gianna, this has become famous well beyond Second Life. Yeah, it's uh, kind of funny, the stories and the things that happen from when you do a project. And uh, a lot of people who maybe weren't familiar with Second Life or weren't active in the community saw it on television. Uh, and that piece eventually went on to be nominated for an Emmy. So that was an incredible <laughs> experience that we're thankful to Jen and Sally for every day. <laughs> <laughs> That's Brilliant. wonderful. Absolutely. Excellent. I'm really looking forward to exploring this. And we'll be doing that shortly, but first we're going to take a short break, purely so I can find a hard hat like you guys. Um, there's mm -hmm. lots more to explore in the virtual mine, so... Don't go away. Radio Real is an internet public radio station with multiple streams on the air daily. We play an extensive variety of music for listeners with eclectic taste, from early music to Victoriana, big band and folk, plus drama and special programs. For more details, visit radioreal.org. The best things in life are free.
welcome back to Designing Worlds, the show for design and designers in virtual worlds. This week we're exploring the virtual mind and we're standing here by the board that is the starting point for the interactive game, which is going to explore many of the issues related to mountaintop removal of the kind that in real life is happening in the Appalachians and which is explored in the film Deep Down Mine. So, Gianna, can you perhaps tell us a little about this board? How does it work? Well, we wanted to have a visual display for what's going on in the game. So it will introduce the level and tell you the objective for that. In this one, it's to get 100 units of coal into the train within 10 minutes. So you can play along with the little timer, or you can just go at your own pace. It will show you your level progress. As we do things, you'll see that increase. Uh, we also have these power, demand, and health and happiness meters that will change throughout the game and kind of give you an idea of what's going on. Uh, visually, so you know what the demand is for the town, uh, how much power you're producing, and then how your health and happiness is affected by the actions that you're taking. And then, of course, uh, the checkbox will come up as you complete each level. All oh, right, neat. Mm. And so it seems to me the first stage is to get into the bulldozers and start knocking down trees. Well, it'll make a change for me to knock things down deliberately on the show, but I'll give it a go. Some of these trees seem to be fighting back. Yes. Yeah, we used sounds actually from the mines that Jen and Sally gathered from us uh, in the towns that they were filming. And uh, we tried to make it so that you could actually feel uh, what it would be like to chop these trees down and maybe attach some emotion to that. I must say, it's not something I would normally want to be doing. Me either. We have had uh, people come to us and say that they were going to report us or the sim to different organizations like Greenpeace. And we're like, great, they're a partner. They would love to hear how you felt when you're jumping down the tree. Uh, and that's kind of the response that we wanted. We wanted people yeah, to be angry. Yeah, people to be and, appalled by it. Yes. Okay, so I think all the trees are gone now. So oh no, there's just one little one over there. Here I go. And once they, you get that last one, will be thrown out. Okay. Right. So now there are the flags. Is this where we set the explosives? Yes. You have to get real close and click, and you can set the explosive. Okay. My goodness, you really do have to be scarily close to do this. Yes. I'm I'm most familiar with closed cast mining, which is of course is highly dangerous, but uh I imagine this must be extremely dangerous too to the individuals involved as well as to the environment. Yes, yes. Okay, I think they're all planted now. Yes, you can see in text it says the explosives are ready for detonation. Ah, I think I'm going to get out of here then. Yeah, we should all climb back up on this hill for safety. And then do we press the detonation? Yes. 
And we'll be able okay. to see the explosion then. So, now we trigger the explosion. Yes. Okay, here I go. Okay, and so now we'll hear the sirens going off. Again, right from the source. And in chat, you can see the countdown. Here it comes. really is a terrifying sight. The devastation is just colossal. Yeah, it really is, even in a virtual environment. Yeah, this is such a small representation of the horrible devastation that happens. Mm. So what's the next stage? Uh, at this point, we can actually go ahead and start mining for the coal and loading the trucks up with the coal in order to take it uh, by train to the power plant. All right, well, let's try that. That looks like an extremely perilous path down the hill, Gianna. I, I gather that the trucks on mountain roads are one of the big problems with the mines as well. Yes, they're definitely one of the biggest problems. When the sim first opened, we had a woman come in and tell us a story of how her son had been killed by one of the trucks uh, that was going up and down the hills around their home in order to transport the coal, and it was very, very sad.
Ah, now, here's one of those media on a prim boards I was talking about earlier. Gianna, can you tell me how these work again? Yes, the media on a prim boards are great because it allows us to expose visitors to so much more than we can put in this little mine. Uh, and so we created a teacher's educational guide to follow along with their classes. And these boards just kind of play into that and offer some further discussion and exploration and um, kind of brings you back into the real world and shows you what's going on and hopefully answers questions, educates you more uh, and gets you interested in these important issues that mm -hmm. the mine brings up. That's brilliant. That's fantastic. And you can watch videos within embedded within web pages, I see. Yes, you can uh, maneuver the websites and uh, read about interesting topics and watch different videos. Uh, and it's a great way to still be immersed in world but learn about all these topics. That's brilliant. And now we can cross the bridge by the river to the power station and the town. And I see the power station is generating some foul smoke and some pretty nasty effluent which is being dumped in the river, upstream of the town too, I assume. Yeah, the pollution that comes as a result of these mines can just be devastating to these towns. It's one of the things that people don't often think about, um, the terrible pollution that occurs from the different factories and water and everything else. Well, we've seen how the coal is extracted and transported to be turned into power. But this is just the beginning of the game. Because to spare yourself the pollution from this, you're going to make, need to make some tough decisions on how to solve the town's power problems. But before we see more, we're going to take another short break. And this time, we'll be seeing some still photographs of the results of mountaintop removal mining in the Appalachians. <coughs> But afterwards, we'll be looking at potential solutions. So... Don't go away!
Welcome back to Designing Worlds, the show for design and designers in virtual worlds, where we're exploring a virtual mountaintop removal mining operation. And having looked at the production of coal and all the damages that causes, we've now come down to the town itself, Maytown, blazing with lights and using up lots of energy. So, what do we need to do here, Jana? Do we call a public meeting? Yes, at this point we have to bring the town together because while by mining we were able to create a lot of power, uh, the, our health and happiness, you know, as you can tell, wasn't, wasn't very fun to do that and it wasn't very good for us or the environment. So in this we can try to sort of reduce some of the demand uh, and reserve some of our power. So that sort of uh, that information on health and happiness we would have seen up at the big board we saw earlier, right? Yes. Ah, okay. Right. So, let's switch off some lights. <laughs> oh, this is quite fun. Yes, it is fun, but you wouldn't want to do it in your own town. Uh, you know, obviously traffic lights are important and store functioning is important and mm. the things inside your home are important. Uh, but it That's is right. still a good thing to think about uh, how you can conserve power without it being so overwhelming. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, turn off the street lights and the streets become less safe to walk. If we turn off the traffic lights, there could be all manner of traffic accidents. So it's not the solution. How close a representation is this of the real town that's the focus in the documentary? Um, there's definitely aspects that are pretty close. Uh, Jen and Sally were able to send us uh, actual footage and photos from the town, and we recreated some of those things. And you'll see many of the signs and sounds that are in the town are actually from the town in which they filmed in. Right. Cool. But I believe there's another part we still have to see. Obviously, this isn't the complete solution. Uh, as we discussed, it's, you know, ineffective in a lot of ways with the traffic mm -hmm. lights. So we need to look for what that final solution might be. Aha. Right. Excellent. And I have a slight suspicion I can guess what that might be. So let's go and see that part, shall we? Great. Aha! Now around us I can see alternative energy sources, solar photovoltaic panels, wind turbines, and there's even some piping to uh, use for hydropower, but it's all rather disassembled. Yes, we have three games now where you have to assemble them in order to create alternate sources of energy. Mm, cool, how does that work then? Uh, for the solar panels, you place them on the roof uh, in sort of a Tetris-like game. For the wind turbines, you just assemble them in the correct order. And for the hydropower, you just assemble them around the obstacles so that the water throws through them. Oh, excellent. That sounds good. So, let's have a go. I'm going to try one of the windmills. And I think I'll tackle the photovoltaic panels, don't you? Okay, so I'm going to build the windmill, uh, the wind turbine, and first of all, I'm going to show you what happens if you make a mistake. <laughs> I love that. Okay, let's do it properly this time. Here we go, that bit. And now that bit, and finally that bit. And I think my wind turbine, yes, it's starting to turn and generate electricity. Right, so here we are, and uh, out of the four or so barns here, this one, to me, looks like the one with the best chances of decent photovoltaic generation because the roof is facing south and it's as far away from the south side of the valley as you can get so that means 
the sun can be lower in the sky and not obscured by the side of the valley. So, put a good 4 kilowatt panel array on here and you could uh, save some serious money. So, let's have a look and see how we might do it. Uh, my temptation would be to start with that and stick it there. And it flies into place. And that one, I think, probably there. There we go. Um, that one. There. And then that one. There. No, not quite there. Just up a bit. There we go. Bing! And there we have it. Excellent. Now my meter's going backwards. Now I'm going to invite our illustrious director Ash to come and do the business with the hydroelectric power system and what she's got to do ladies and gentlemen is to connect up the water source with the outflow so that water can flow through those turbines which are the bits nearest to you on the screen at the moment and uh, as you can see there are some problems with rocks in the way so she's going to have to root round them. And there she goes. We can't actually see her at the moment. We can see her pipes, however, which is what we need to know about. And she's off to an excellent start there. Just needs some straight sections, I should think, to get down to the turbine in the bottom right-hand corner. And there's one connection completed. Excellent. Let's leave that alone now. Yeah, this is what I was trying to do. Yay! Okay. There we go. Very nice. Now this here. Yep. And this one here. Yay! That's number two done. And there's only one connection left to do. Yep. How are we getting there we go? Excellent. And the last section goes into place. And, and the now... water flows. Yeah, here it goes. Excellent. Yay. And off go the turbines. And there's the hydropower. Well, this has been fun and also very educational. This is a really powerful tool. Thank you. Yes, we are. We have been so thrilled with the work that Sandcastle Studios did. I mean, look around. It's, it's just mm. gorgeous from the trees to the details. I mean, it really does feel like you're in an Appalachian town and we spent a lot of time there. So, so we know. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, actually. Yeah, excellent. And you've designed it so that people who are new to Second Life can quickly become involved, which I think is uh, is quite an achievement, frankly. Yeah, we really wanted to make sure that new, old, everybody could participate and have fun. We were hoping, actually, that this might be a first-time experience for many people because we're advertising it basically through our PBS broadcast. So every time that our film plays on PBS, which it's still going to do for the next four years, there will also be a short about the virtual mine with the URL where people can find information about it. So they can basically hop from our website and through in a couple of simple steps, just get right in here instead of going through um, sort of the training ground. That's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's very, very impressive. And uh, it seems to me to be a very important and timely work 
on such a very important set of issues like energy production and, of course, climate change. Yeah, I think what we wanted to do through both the film and through this project here in Second Life was really to make a, a more direct connection between the energy that we consume and how that's affecting people across the country. So, you know, we're all connected through the things that we consume and just by flipping on a light switch, uh, you know, we're basically causing harm to others and to our own environment and the water and air and everything that we all share. So that was what we wanted to commun communicate through the story of the film and also through this um, game experience that anyone can play. Right, it's certainly a very effective, very effective tool. Well, if you want to see more about the virtual mine and the documentary, there's a website available at deepdownfilm.org. And it's very definitely worth a visit, both to learn more and to explore the games, to see how Second Life can be used in this really innovative way. Well, this has been a really fascinating show, but sadly, as all shows do in the end, it's now coming towards its end. So I'd like to thank Gianna Borgnine of Sandcastle Studios and the makers of the doc documentary Deep Down Mine. Thank you so much for being with us today. Yes, thank you, Jan. It was great to have you on the show. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks, and thanks for giving us this opportunity to showcase the virtual mine. And don't forget that if you want to see this program again, you'll be able to catch it over the coming week on the Treat TV Lifestyle channel and on the Designing Worlds page at treat.tv or on the Designing Worlds blog. Next week, we'll be in the studio for a discussion show. We'll be talking to creators who are taking elements of Second Life into real life sort of the other way round from this program. <laughs> it should be a fascinating show, so don't miss it. But for now, we must leave you and wish you fair winds and clear waters. Fair winds and clear waters, especially in the Appalachians. Thank <laughs> you.